We are in Acts 19. Oh, I, I do want to remind us that next Wednesday, hopefully there'll be more than just us here, but we're going we're gonna to stuff Easter eggs. Hopefully we'll have some more hands. Um, but uh, we'll do what we can, even if it's just us. So that's next Wednesday. We'll, we'll have some tables set up here and, and stuff Easter eggs. Uh, we may have to recruit from the, the kids in the, in the back there, but uh, hopefully we'll have a few more hands. Um, to, to be able to do that. So that's next Wednesday. And again, everything going on the following weekend, Saturday is our Easter egg hunt. Um, and then Sunday, of course, is Easter. And so we, uh, we, we just want to remember all that. Please remember all that in prayer. Uh, Acts chapter 19. I'm going to read the first 10 verses and then we're going to talk about it. Uh, by the way, welcome to anybody and everybody that may be on Facebook. We welcome you. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Finding some uh, disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, And to what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were were (laughs) baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when uh, Paul had laid hands on them, The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. And when he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and, and withdrew the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both the Jews and Greeks. Now, if you remember last week, if you anything like me, can't remember yesterday, but if you remember last week, we talked about Paul kind of ending his second missionary journey, and he went back to Jerusalem, but before he went to Jerusalem, he stopped in Ephesus. Then he went to Jerusalem, um, and, then, and then from Jerusalem, he began his what's considered his third missionary journey, and that's kind of where we, we pick up here um, as he's uh, starting, his, starting his third missionary journey. And uh, he went to a couple other cities, but he ends up here in Ephesus. And if we remember towards the end of last week, he did stop at Ephesus, but he said he stayed, he stayed for a short time because if you remember, right, he said, I must go to Jerusalem to, to partake of the feast um, and also to, um, um, to present his, his vow, the vow of the Nazarite. And so now he's back to Ephesus, kind of, Keeping his promise of because he said, I, I can't stay long. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I can't stay long, but I'll be back. Kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. Um, and so he kept his promise. He's back. So uh, Paul was last in Ephesus on his way from Corinth. That's what we talked about last week. Again, on his second missionary journey. Now he came from the east, arriving in Ephesus from the region of the east. He came back to Ephesus as he had promised in Acts 18.21. That's what we we talked about last week. (coughs) He ran across these disciples. Uh, And it's important that we we, uh, recognize that um, they are named disciples. That they're they're, they're, uh, already what is considered disciples. They weren't... weren't, uh, they weren't converted by Paul. 
um, but they were already considered disciples. And we'll talk about that for a second. There was something about these disciples that prompted this question from Paul. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That was the question. We don't have any indication that it was his custom to go around asking people if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed. I, I don't remember in the last several chapters him asking that question. Um, at least not to everyone. By their reply, these Ephesian disciples, again, remember that word disciples, showed they, they didn't know much about God's nature as revealed in Jesus. They knew enough to be saved and to be students of Jesus. That's why they were called disciples. But they didn't know much about all Jesus did for us, especially in the promise to send the Holy Spirit when he ascended to heaven. It may be that this was not the core group of disciples that Paul originally spoke to in Ephesus. Again, we read about this, if you, if you remember last week in Acts 18, where Paul uh, preached and there was converts, and he left Aquila and Priscilla to disciple them. And so these were probably, most likely, not those converts, not those disciples. Um, so these were probably not the ones that he spoke to that we talked about last week. And whom Aquila and Pris Priscilla were left behind to serve. Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul for a year and a half in Corinth. We talked about that last week. And it seems from his letters to the Corinthians that Paul taught them about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. These disciples may have been new or young disciples, not the core group of, e of Ephesus or at Ephesus that we talked about last week. These uh, Ephesian disciples had only a basic understanding of the Messiah Jesus and his ministry. Only what could be gained through the message of John the Baptist. They were in the same place as we talked about at the end of, of last week, the chapter 18. We talked about this man named Apollos. Anybody remember that? Um, and Apollos was kind of right along the same lines of these disciples that Paul is uh, converting here. Or not converting, but, but bringing... Uh, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, asking them that and baptizing them in the... Well, he's not doing it, but you understand what I'm saying. And so Apollos was kind of that, that same um, understanding. You know, going back to when Jesus walked on the surf, we know there was John the Baptist, that was the forerunner, and there, there was disciples of John the Baptist before Jesus was even around in his earthly ministry. And so John the Baptist preached repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't preach, you know, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, there's one coming. He said, I baptize with water, but there's one coming that baptizes with the Holy Spirit with fire. And, um, you know, of course, he's talking about Jesus. And so the disciples that were converted by John the Baptist preaching probably understood and possibly even knew or possibly even heard about Jesus, but didn't really follow Jesus. Even though they were, they didn't understand. And so this is kind of the, the, kind of the parallel. They were saved, but they didn't quite, they knew about the Messiah and they might not even knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't, Follow Jesus while he was on the earth. They didn't, you know, like we talked about Sunday, maybe they weren't there for the Sermon of the Mount. They, they, maybe they were convert, converted by John the Baptist and they went to Ephesus or went wherever. Um, and so along with the Ephesians from last chapter, chapter 18, when, when Paul uh, went to Ephesus the first time and even with Apollos, now these 12, the Bible says there was 12, they were converted into the baptism of Jesus or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
And so it was kind of a learning. It was probably like, wow. <laughs> you know, kind of, I mean, I, you kind of say it like this. They went from level one to level two or from level one to level ten, just like that by, by uh, meeting Paul and, and being um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we talk about Aquila and Priscilla who were friends of Paul in Corinth that Paul left them in Ephesus and they continued to disciple, they continued to teach. And, and Apollos, who uh, you know, we'll, we'll hear about several different times, but Apollos was another one of those, uh, if you want to call it convert. He was already converted, but he went to level 10 from level 1, kind of, it's lack of a better word. Uh, they could have received John's baptism from the hands of John himself, or perhaps from one of John's disciples who continued on uh, in his ministry after John's death. So it's not clear whether these, they were of John's ministry, but it's unclear if they were directly connected with John or it it was from his disciples, just kind of like Jesus' disciples. Paul points out that John's baptism was one of repentance, not necessarily faith unto salvation. John's message pointed to Jesus, but did not take men there themselves. So pointed to the Messiah, pointed to the one, but possibly they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus came. And so they repented, but they didn't actually have that relationship uh, because they didn't know about the relationship that the Messiah came and was there. John said he's coming, but maybe they didn't know he came. We can imagine that these Ephesian disciples heard about the coming of the Messiah through John's message, and they heard their need to be ready through repentance to receive the Messiah. Yet they actually do not seem to have heard that the Messiah had in fact come and had not heard of their need to trust in his specific person or work. And again, they knew a Messiah was coming, but they didn't know Jesus was the Messiah and came. They may have heard about it, but they, maybe they, maybe they haven't, didn't hear about it, but they were, again, in, John, uh, uh, in John's baptism. Having been completely prepared by their response to the preaching of John the Baptist, they were ready to embrace Jesus fully and were baptized in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. After they were baptized, Paul laid hands on them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and received his gifts. It said that they all spoke in tongues and prophesied. Got a gnat or something. Messing with me. (laughs) Uh, Paul wrote, (laughs) y'all thought the Holy Spirit took over, right? (laughs) Paul wrote the letters. Yeah. (laughs) So Matt, I I think I got it. I don't know. Paul wrote the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians during his stay in the city of Ephesus. At this time, And 1 Corinthians has much to say, as if you've read 1 Corinthians, to say about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, we can kind of see a timing as we're talking about Paul's missionary journeys and and going from city to city. I think it was last week or the week before we talked about, he wrote the the letter of 1 Thessalonians when he was in the city of Corinth. And so we can see these letters that he's, he's, he's went to these cities or these towns and, and people were converted and he's writing these letters back to them to enhance or to, to help or to strengthen these churches that have been planted. And so here in Ephesus, who we know is um, the book of Ephesians eventually, um, 
that we, uh, or the book of Ephesians, Ephesians would be to the city of Ephesus, which he's at now, but he's not writing the letter now. He's writing First and Second Corinthians. So um, just interesting, the, the time there. Um, after, let's see, uh, first, of, first and Second Corinthians, during his stay uh, in the city of Ephesus, and uh, I think I read that, these Ephesian disciples sensed their need to get right with God and knew the answer was in God's Messiah. But they had gone no further than that. They need to go all the way to trust in everything Jesus is and everything he had done and to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. God always wants us to go deeper. We tend to sip where we could drink deeply. We drink deeply where we could wade in. We wade in where we could plunge in and swim. Most of us need to be encouraged to go deeper and further into the things of the Holy Spirit. You know, this is just like our Christian walk. We should never be satisfied. I don't care how long you've been saved, there's always more. That's just the honest truth. If you've been saved 100 years, there's always more. You can always get closer to God. I believe that, that we'll never get as close to God as we need to be until we get to heaven. I'm not even sure if that, that will do it. Um, we may even when we're in heaven want to get closer to God. But there's, there's always room for more. There's always room uh, you know, to go deeper in the things of the Lord. Um, he went into the synagogue, as he normally always does in every city, and spoke boldly for three months, the Bible said. Paul had extended time of preaching. Sometimes he's only there once. Or another city, he was there for three times. But eventually, the influence of the Jews who rejected the messages drove him out. He then resumed his teaching in the hall of a Gentile teacher named Tyrannus, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, the Bible said. Paul did this daily. Meaning, he did this, he taught every day. Considering his extended time in Ephesus, this meant that he taught for many hundreds of hours of teaching. I read one commentary that said he probably taught from 10 to 4, because that would be their time of rest. Um, from 10 to 4, that he probably taught on a daily basis which would be, you know, five, six hours a day for every day for years, uh, basically two years. Uh, many hours of teaching. Um, it is no wonder that the work in Ephesus was so broad and effective. Paul carried this on for two years, and his effective teaching equipped believers who got the word of God out to all who dwelt in Asia, the Bible said. By himself, there was no way that Paul could reach this region, but he could equip Christians to do the work of the ministry, just as he described in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. One of y'all want to look that up and read those two verses for us? Hey, Sister Weta. She's online. 11 and 12. And he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And we all come into the unity of faith. Okay. So what she just read, he gave evangelists and pastors, and I'm just going to throw a few things in here, church planners and teachers and uh, uh, you know, children's church teachers and, and all these to do what? To equip the saints for the ministry. So everything we do, it's, you know, it's not just the pastor's responsibility or the leader's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility to be equipped to perform the ministry, right? Um, and so Paul couldn't do it by himself, just like 
A pastor can't do it by himself. I can't be here and teach kids at the same time. I mean, it's impossible. Um, I can't be here and be in children's church at the same time. Impossible. Um, I can't be here and uh, do a media at the same time, right? Impossible. And so he, we equip everyone to do the work of the ministry. All right. Uh, any thoughts or questions for that? All right. Verse number 11. 11 and 12, two verses. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Now Luke states here that these were unusual miracles and gives an example of that Paul's handkerchiefs or aprons, or it could be literally his sweatbands, uh, something that was on his body, uh, could be laid on a person, even without Paul present, and that person was healed or delivered from demonic possession. That's where we get, the, in the church, we get the example of prayer cloths from this, these verses here, that we anoint a prayer cloth, not that it's us, but that, it's the power of the Lord that is, uh, you know, the prayer cloths taken to a, someone sick or somebody going through something or, or something like that. And uh, it's, it's used as a symbol of healing or even deliverance. We don't know really, or we don't really know how this worked other than the same way that the shadow of Peter that we read about in Acts 5 or the hem of Jesus' garment in Matthew 14, 36 might heal. The item became a point of contact by which a person released faith in Jesus as healer. God worked unusual miracles. This phrase could be translated miracles not of the ordinary kind. Even if we should expect miracles, these were the unexpected kind of miracles. And it does not say that uh, Paul did these unusual miracles, but that God worked them by the hands of Paul. Again, it's not us. It's God. Any thoughts or questions there or comments? All right. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant, Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So at this time, the city of Ephesus... There were Jewish exorcists who practiced their trade with a lot of superstition and ceremony. They said, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. The Jewish exorcists failed because they had no personal relationship with Jesus. They said, the Jesus whom Paul preached, they didn't know who this was. 
They only knew that Jesus was the God of Paul, not their God. We could say that the, the sons of Siva did not have the right to use the name of Jesus because they had no real personal connection to Jesus. In the same pattern, there are many people, many churchgoers, who will perish in hell because they have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They only know the Jesus the pastor preaches or the Jesus my spouse believes in or even maybe the Jesus that I, I grew up hearing about in church instead of the Jesus of their own personal relationship. We talked about this Sunday, talking about, you know, Lord, you know, why are, we called you Lord, Lord, you know, we, we, we uh, uh, cast out demons in your name, we prayed in your name, and all these, and he, I mean, one of the saddest verses, in my, my, my uh, opinion, I never knew you, depart from me, I never knew you, and this is kind of along that line, even though they had no kind of relationship with them. They tried to use what kind of copycat the what Paul was doing for their own benefit. Maybe even for their own pride. I kind of I kind of like I mean it's sad, but I kind of like the this response here. Um, not that I'm glorifying demons, but the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? The evil spirit knew exactly who Jesus was and knew exactly who Paul was, but they didn't know who the seven sons of Siva were. Apparently, evil spirits know who their enemies are, in this case, Jesus and Paul. And they don't waste their effort knowing those who aren't a threat to them, in this case, the seven sons of Siva. Because the seven sons of Siva had no real relationship with Jesus, they had no spiritual power over this evil spirit. They left the encounter naked and wounded, the Bible said. Remember, seven men, seven sons of Siva, were beat up, naked and wounded, the Bible says. It was dangerous for them to take the reality of spiritual Warfare so lightly. That's why it's, you know, it's dangerous for us in our day and time, but people do it all the time. They get involved with you know, horoscopes or you know, uh, um, psychics and all of this kind of stuff and just opening up a door, opening up a door for an evil spirit. They think it's harmless or they think lightly, but no, it's not. Um. I saw it the other day, and I didn't even realize there was something like that. It's, it's downtown. It said something like the something paranoia, the office of the paranoia or something right here in Perry in downtown. Something they, I don't, I don't even know what it is, but I just thought it was weird. Um, it's down, I think it was down there by, uh, I think it was down there by the newspaper office somewhere right in that area. I think I've seen it too. Or it was down there by the, it was either there or it was down there by the um, probation. One of those. I, I can't remember. I'm like, what in the world is that? Um, people just take it so lightly. But it's, it's not. Just like these sons of Siva. They thought they could just abuse. But they learned their lesson, I'm sure. The incident with the sons of Siva impressed the people with the reality of the demonic realm. It made them fear the Lord and the demonic, both in healthy ways. As a result, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Ephesus was a stronghold for Satan. Here, what we just read, many evil things, both superstitious and satanic, were practiced. Books containing formulas or spells for sorcery and other ungodly and unforbidden arts were plentiful in that city. The Bible said many, now catch this, many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Apparently before the Sons of Siva incident, many believers did not know they were involved in the demonic. 
They saw their actions in a far more innocent light until they knew the reality of demonic activities. People just take that so lightly. I don't believe in demons. Well, I got news for you. They were real. The Sons of Siva incident also prompted Christians to renounce any remaining connection to the demonic. They renounced the demonic by confessing and by burning their magic books, disregarding whatever the value they had. It is very significant that these practitioners of magic came confessing and telling their deeds. That's what the Bible said. It was thought that the power of these magic spells was in their secrecy, which was renounced in the telling. So in other words, it was happening in the dark, maybe secretly, but you know, just like any sin, once it's brought to the light, once it's out in the open, it loses its power. And that's what happened here. That was it, it, they, they came confessing, the people that believed, but they still maybe practiced. Or maybe they were just new converts, but they were still practicing and still doing these things, maybe in the dark, maybe secretly, maybe they weren't telling anybody, but by coming and confessing and bringing it out to the light, of course, we know that darkness can't mix with light. And so it lost their power. It lost the power by confessing and by bringing uh, and telling their deeds. These books and scrolls full of magic charms, amulets, and incantations were well known in Ephesus, and they were valuable. The value of 50,000 pieces of silver, the Bible said. Today, that has an estimation of about $5 million dollars. So that's a pretty, some pretty valuable stuff that they burned up. Had a big bonfire. Christians must do this also today, removing books, images, computer files, statue, charms, games, or whatever else might have connection with demonic spirits. They need to clean house. They should also destroy them so they are no use to others. The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, the Bible said. This demonstrates that the end result was obviously worth it all. The work in Ephesus and the region of Roman Asia continued in a remarkable way. Thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. Verse 21. When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of failing or falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul determined his itinerary. We know throughout the last several weeks that, that the Holy Spirit led Paul that there were some places he wanted to go, and the Holy Spirit said no. So we know that through the Holy Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul did what Paul did. He decided to travel through Macedonia and Achaia, then to Jerusalem, then to Rome. Paul doesn't mention it here, but we know that one reason why Paul wanted to go through Macedonia and Achaia, then to Jerusalem, was to collect and deliver 
a fund he had been collecting from other churches to help out the church in Jerusalem. He said, I must also see Rome. Reflects Paul's passion to visit and serve the Christian community that was already there. Paul sent Timothy and Erastus on ahead to Macedonia while he stayed in Ephesus or Asia for a time. A significant part of the work of Timothy and Erastus was simply to help Paul. They were truly assistants to the apostle, helping Paul to maximize his ministry. When the work was going well and when Paul was thinking about leaving Ephesus, of course, another commotion arose, a, a riot. Again, for the third time in Acts, the Christian movement is called the way. Uh, this man named Demetrius said this trade of ours in danger of falling into distribute, distribute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed. This tremendous temple to Diana, also known as Artemis, in Ephesus was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was supported by 127 pillars, each 60 feet high, and was decorated with great sculptures. It was lost to history until it was discovered in 1869, and its main altar was unearthed in 1965. The Temple of Diana in Ephesus was indeed famous around the world. The trinkets and the idols, it must have been a substantial trade, no matter how immoral the worship of the sex goddess was. The opposition of Demetrius, this man, Demetrius, who was a silversmith, and the other idol makers was a great compliment to the effectiveness of Paul's work in this region. Paul was not on a campaign to close down the temple of Diana. He just did the Lord's work. And as people came to Jesus, guess what they did? They stopped going to worship the goddess Diana and the shrines associated with the temple. So it just naturally happened. It was something that Paul planned. He was preaching Jesus. He wasn't preaching against Diana in particular, but he was preaching Jesus and as they were converting, guess what? They left the evil. Demetrius was clever in how he spoke to the crowd. He first appealed to them both on the basis of financial self-interest and then on the basis of civic pride. How dare Paul insult and despise our great temple? Yet we'll read here in just a minute in Acts 19.37, the city clerk specifically said, that Paul had not blasphemed the goddess Diana. Paul was on a pro-Jesus campaign more than an anti-everything else campaign. Again, his, his main focus was to preach Jesus and to make converts. All right, we're going to finish this up. Verse 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and that the image which fell down from Zeus? 
Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you might, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger of becoming called into question for today's outroar. There being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Pretty interesting. The Bible said the whole city, the whole city was filled with confusion. And we know that confusion doesn't come from God. He's not the author of confusion. And they rushed into the theater with one accord. Considering Rome's iron-fisted attitude towards such civil disorder, things were rapidly getting out of hand. Alexander wanted to make sure that the mob knew that the Jews did not approve of Paul either. But he accomplished nothing before this angry mob. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. This repeated chant must have sent a chill up the back of the Christians, including Paul, who no doubt could hear it from outside the theater. For two hours, this whole assembly shouted, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The city clerk, something like the mayor of the city, spoke sensible words. Luke wanted to show that rational people saw nothing to fear or oppose in Christ Christianity. God worked mightily in Ephesus, but so did the devil. This may be one reason why Paul wrote so specifically about the spiritual battle each Christian faces against powers of spiritual darkness in his letter to the Ephesians in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. That's, that's verses talking about the armor of God. And that we don't fight against flesh and blood. He dismissed the assembly. God used the city clerk to calm the mob and to end the immediate threat to Paul and the other Christians. God had preserved his work and his people again. They keep fighting. The devil keeps fighting. But he can't fight against God. God's the winner every time. And God is our helper. He is our protector. So any thoughts or questions or comments? Any, anything you want to add, subtract? John the Baptist and Jesus were related. Yes, they were cousins. Yeah. First cousins, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yep, well, yeah, I guess they were first cousins. Because Elizabeth and Mary were cousins. Well, they were kind of cousins. So, yeah, they were, kind of cousins. they were cousins, yeah. I guess to each other they were they were cousins. So but yes, they were related. John the Baptist would have been just a little bit older. Just because they were pregnant at the same time. Yeah. So good question. Any other? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are our protector, Lord, that you are the one that is with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, Father. And we're just thankful for your word tonight. Lord, we're, we're thankful, Lord, for all that you are doing, Lord, in our lives and in our church and our community. Lord, we just pray you continue to touch us and help us. Give us favor. Lord, continue to bless us so we can be a blessing to others. And Lord, as we leave this place, protect us from all harm, danger, sickness, disease. Go before us, Lord. Shine your face upon us. Give us peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate whoever's on still online. I know Sister Weeda is. We love you. Wish you were here. God bless you.